So we now have the great pleasure of presenting the 2021 Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation. In 2011, the prize was endowed by a generous gift to Wharton from Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy. It is given every two years to recognize outstanding quantitative research that has contributed to a particular innovation in the practice of finance. It is accompanied by an $80,000 cash award and a sterling silver medal, which is an emblem of the prize in its recognition of groundbreaking research. We are delighted to have the 2021 winners, Narasimhan Jagadish and Sheridan Tipman, with us here in person to accept their award for their research on momentum investing. I think it's fair to say when this work was completed, it certainly challenged the expanding view then of the superiority of passive investment strategies and has had an undeniable impact on the world of investing. To discuss the innovation further, let me bring Chris up. Thanks, Craig. Uh, throughout the program, we've explored the impact of Jagadish and Pittman's prize-winning work. Their 93 Journal of Finance paper, Returns to Buying Winners and Selling Losers, Implications for Stock Market Efficiency, was a direct challenge to the conventional investing approach of buy low, sell high, uh, and gave rise to much further research on momentum effects and strategies in both academia uh, and in practice. And judging from what numerous people say, uh, you can actually see in real time the number of citations moving. <laughs> uh, in the decade following the paper's publication, Fund managers increasingly adopted momentum-based investing strategies, uh, which continue to be widely employed today, and academics furthered uh, what became a virtual growth industry employing and examining the notion of momentum. Many, many studies, uh, some looking far back as the 19th century, have repeated, underscored, tested, and generally confirmed the findings uh, by Jagadish and Titman. Our 2021 prize winners were chosen by a committee of esteemed academics and practitioners. Uh, thank you to Bruce Jacobs for steering the committee purposefully as chair, and to Jen Bender, Kent Daniel, Robert Novi Marks, uh, and Matthew Rodman, uh, Rothman for your valuable contributions as members. I had the pleasure of serving on the committee in an ex officio capacity, and it's truly an honor and a privilege to recognize this work uh, chosen through such a process filled with integrity. Uh, and uh, before we hear directly from them about their work, I'd like uh, uh, to introduce again Bruce Jacobs and Ken Levy. Please join me in welcoming Bruce and Ken to the front. Thank you, Chris and Craig. Um, in investing, as we all know by now, momentum is defined as the tendency of an asset that has recently outperformed to continue to outperform. So it looks like Sir Isaac Newton had it right with his first law of motion. And as far back as the 18th century, investors seemed to have an inkling of this phenomena. The famed British economist David Ricardo, who made a fortune speculating in stock, advised, quote, cut short your losses, let your profits run, unquote. 19th and early 20th century investment manuals often recommended what we now call momentum strategies. But momentum never neatly fit into the late 20th century world of efficient markets and modern portfolio theory. Nevertheless, Narasimhan Jagadish and Sheridan Titman, winners of the 2021 Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize, have shown us how it could be applied systematically by skilled practitioners. Our distinguished honorees would be the first to tell you that they can't say with certainty what causes momentum or accounts for its persistence. Nevertheless, theories of momentum's origins and persistence abound. One survey of the literature found at least 10 potential explanations. We look forward to hearing Narasimhan and Sheridan's latest thoughts on this. As with any factor, the benefits of momentum can disappear suddenly and for extended periods. This may point to a risk-based explanation, but in a 2011 follow-up to their seminal 1993 paper, Jagadish and Tidman argue that the magnitude and persistence of momentum returns are too strong to be explained by risk. Instead, many see momentum as the result of investors being slow to react to new information, in other words, to underreact, 
causing prices to adjust slowly but persistently. An alternative explanation is that investors overreact to new information, pushing prices up or down. But why do investors underreact or overreact? The list of potential behavioral explanations is a long one and includes overconfidence, the disposition effect, and cognitive dissonance. In a 2020 Wall Street Journal article, Subramanyam and Titman offered a more succinct explanation of overconfidence, quote, investors tend to have too much confidence in their own ability to evaluate stocks and too little in the ability of others, unquote. So whatever you believe explains the momentum effect, we are grateful to our honorees for their meticulous research that gave new life to this factor, which allows investors to harness it. The Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation recognizes outstanding quantitative research that has contributed to an important innovation in the practice of finance. The 2021 Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize recipients, Narasinam Jagadish and Sheridan Titman, are being honored for their work documenting the momentum premium. Robert Schiller called their seminal 1993 paper, Returns to Buying Winners and Selling Losers, Implications for Stock Market Efficiency, a bombshell. It can be summed up with a simple set of instructions. Buy stocks that have performed well and sell stocks that have performed poorly. Jagadish and Tittman's findings seem to contradict much of what we thought we knew about investing, including the efficient market hypothesis, the random walk theory, the capital asset pricing model, and even buy low, sell high. And yet their model, elegant in its simplicity, describes a factor of unusual strength and robustness. Subsequent studies have shown that momentum has produced return premiums in and out of sample in dozens of countries and asset classes for hundreds of years. And while we're not close to understanding why stock price momentum persists, this is part of the beauty of our honorees' work. By shining a bright light on classical beliefs about how markets work, they have challenged us and themselves to gain a deeper understanding of stock price behavior so that our theories better reflect market realities. In the meantime, their momentum model has provided skilled practitioners with a tool for improving investor outcomes. When Ken and I established this biennial award in 2011, it was our hope that over time, the recipients would constitute an elite group of scholars and practitioners who have had a transformative impact on finance. Jagadish and Titman now join Markowitz, Sharp, Ross, and Ball and Brown as prize winners. We are proud to award the 2021 Wharton Jacobs Levy Prize for Quantitative Financial Innovation to Narasinam Jagadish and Sheridan Titman in recognition of their groundbreaking accomplishments. Thank you for your contributions, and a hearty congratulations to both of you. Narasinam and Sheridan, please join us for the presentation of the prize medals. It's a pleasure on our part and Wharton's part to award you with the prize medals. Thank you very much. It's indeed a great honor to receive this award. 
the Wharton Jacobs Levy Center Award and joined the esteemed colleagues, uh, the list of whom is pretty impressive and we are really happy to join them. I'd like to thank both of you, Bruce and Ken and the Wharton Center and the Selection Committee for, uh, for bestowing this honor on us. And I would like to thank and for setting up this exciting conference to go along with that. And I would like to thank all of you for coming here and joining the, uh, joining the award, okay? Uh, joining the celebrations. So looking back, we started work on this about 30 years back, okay? So to put that in perspective, I thought I'll start with a picture of us taken a little after this paper was published, okay? So as you can tell, a lot of time has passed, but fortunately, the paper aged better than its authors. <laughs> so, uh, and th this award makes me, uh, evokes a bit of nostalgia. And so let me start with talking about how we started work on this proje project, okay? And because of its uh, surprise, surprising results, much more surprising at that point in time than it, what it may be today, it evoked a lot of interest. It, it, it intrigued the academics, uh, and people started thinking about, well, what are the potential explanations? One of the reasons for this impact is it, it, uh, it stimulated the interest in saying, okay, this must be the explanation because our prior was markets were so efficient, and how did it work out? So in the second part of my talk, I'll talk about, I'll categorize, broadly categorize different explanations, I'll present some evidence and give you my thoughts, present some recent evidence, and give you my thoughts on various possibilities, possible explanations. Okay, so that's the way, that's the way I'm going to uh, structure the talk. Okay, so the way we started is, uh, at one time, Sheridan at that time was working with Mark Grinblatt, examining mutual funds. One of their findings was that, well, mutual funds seem to buy past winners versus you know, uh, and selling losers. And at that time, the academic thought was, the anomaly that was getting a lot of attention was reversals. In the long term, there was a paper by DeBart and Thaler which said there were three, uh, in three to five years, stocks that went up came down. And I had my own paper which talks about in one month return reversals for the given month, it goes back up. What goes down went up. So uh, the prevailing theme was it's uh, re return reversals, okay? So rather than Newton's law of uh, physics and momentum, it was more Newton's law of gravity. When it goes up, it comes back down eventually. That was the, uh, that was the thinking at that point. So Sheridan brought up this apparent contradiction. At that time, I was also working on returns predicting previous returns. They said, so this is the, uh, this is from my dissertation and from my paper in the Journal of Finance, which I had previously published. So as you can see, my focus was primarily on, this is basically returns regressed against past returns at various horizons. So A1 is the coefficient on one month lag return, A2 is on two month lag return, and so on and so forth. And A13 and A14 are on 24 month and 36 month lag coefficients. Okay, so my focus was pretty much on A1, which was you know, point, uh, 0.09, and the others were not as big. But also 12, 24, and 36 they intrigued me quite a bit because they were much longer. So that was my focus. Looking back, if you look at the coefficients A3, 4, 5, and 6, there's a hint of momentum. I did not focus specifically on the implications of those coefficients until I had this discussion with uh, Sheridan. And then we said, okay, let's, you know, we've looked at one month, we looked at three to five years. These are not the typical holding periods for many of the mutual funds. So why don't we just focus directly on what may be their uh, preferred holding period, which is about six to 12 months. Okay, so that's how we started on this work. We were working on two different areas and the, these two ideas came together and we started the momentum work. So we said, okay, let's keep it simple. Okay, so let's keep it simple. Let's look at what happens if we buy, look back three months, buy, buy stocks and hold it for three months. 
and do the same thing for up to 12 months, okay? So in this panel, what, what it says is, if you buy the winners and sell the losers, J is how many months back you look back, and K is how, much, how many months you hold it for, okay? So surprisingly, uh, it all came up with, you know, most of them, except for the one, one, uh, one cell here, everything was significant. Then he said, okay, why don't we skip a week? Because you know, from a, we know that there's some short-term return reversals. Once we skipped a week, uh, it, all of them became significant, including one which was not significant, the first one. So this was a pretty simple strategy, which you know, some of I see a lot of young faces here. And at that time, as a young faculty member, when they saw these threes and fours of these statistics clearly, I said, wow, that's pretty good. Uh, that's the kind of significance we are looking for. And that's what we found. Now, why did it become interesting? First, from a practitioner standpoint, as Bruce and Ken mentioned, yeah, they want to have profitable trading strategies. So there's a simple signal which gives them a simple positive profitable signal, okay? Uh, that's, that's important. That became of interest to practitioners. So it became, once we had published this paper, it became more widely used. And the, well, the academics became interested because this is, it came at a time when they were, we were under efficient market hypothesis was considered well established. But here is a set of simple strategies that seem to make huge profits. And you know, we listed out all the strategies we considered. So, uh, so that, that became very intriguing. Then the naturally, the natural thing to do next is you focus on what is the explanation. In fact, just to give you an idea of, okay, just to give you an idea of the efficient market hypothesis, how strongly it was uh, embedded in people's thinking, when I first showed this result to my dissertation advisors, they, they were basically very skeptical. They said, no, go back and check your program for bugs. So that, that's how difficult it was to change people's mind that maybe there are some inefficiencies, little inefficiencies, I don't know, uh, when we showed these results. So it's in that context, we started getting, we got this paper, and therefore, a lot of papers followed talking about potential explanations, okay? So I'll broadly categorize them as data mining, risk, and behavioral explanation. So I'll present some evidence to see, okay, what are we talking about here, okay? Uh, so here, all these explanations started soon after we published the paper, and even today, I was, I'm glad to see people are still thinking about it. Okay, so that's a that's, uh, plus side. So I will call them data mining, risk-based explanation, and behavioral explanations, okay? So data mining is pretty straightforward because collectively all of us have churned the, uh, churned the data and we collectively considered millions of uh, possible strategies, right? So was momentum significant by chance uh, in our sample period, okay? So that would be data mining, it happened by chance. Now, it, that is very hard to address uh, because you, know, you can only see, but look back. What, what can you do about data mining? So people have looked back even farther back than what we looked at. But some, some researchers said, okay, you have to have t-statistics of four or five to allow for collective data mining, okay? But fortunately, with the passage of 30 years, we have later sample periods. So I can look at how does price momentum perform post-1989, okay? It did have a difficult period, but when I looked at it post-89, okay? So I looked at it both in the uh, U, uh, US and by of an international, okay? So this is 20, uh, 90 to uh, 2021. Okay, so the US data, I just looked at it. And for the uh, international data, this is from a paper, my paper with uh, Subra and uh, Amit. So that, that's where we are getting this from. And we still find that, well, US, it still works, which is actually a surprise to me because I was following all this 2008 and nine crashes, but it looks like it came down and then again, maybe less people started focusing on it. So when I look, you have to, for data mining, you have to look at a long sample period, okay? So addressing it, looking at it exposed is a difficult task. You have to wait for it for fairly long. So it seems to still work, okay? So international also, all, year, all markets except US, it still works, 
Okay, so it works in developed countries and uh, emerging markets. Everywhere we just looked at individual stocks, and this is what happens. Okay, so the natural next question is, why does it, why does it persist? I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, people that uh, our idea is once they see it, a lot of people will rush in and eliminate this, uh, eliminate such profits. So the fact that it persists may just mean that it's riskier. Winners are riskier than losers, right? Because how else will it persist for so long? Uh, markets earn a premium for a long time. That's because markets are riskier than the fixed income uh, bonds. Okay, so is it the same way? Okay, so that's one of the hypotheses, which we have to very seriously entertain. If any, for any, uh, uh, any anomaly with the longevity, that's something we had to we have to explore. So how do we define risk? Okay, we can look at the conventional evidence, the empirical evidence, and say, okay, what metrics we use? We can use well-known metrics such as market beta, uh, firm size. Again, this became a risk factor once after the early work in the 80s, so maybe that. Or HML beta, pharma French value beta. Or we can think about volatility, which was even designed before that. So all these things, the interesting part is losers are exposed to bigger risk than winners. Okay, so that's, so the next question becomes, well, how about conditional risk? There may be other sources of risk. You know, these are known risk metrics. How about unknown risk metrics that we really don't know about? Okay, so if you look at you know, time-varying growth options, that's one was proposed, but uh, I don't have much time to go into that. Uh, but time varying with respect to unobservable factors. Okay, so that's a very difficult concept to address because if you don't observe it, how do you even measure its contribution? Uh, one of the things we can do is what was there in the morning paper. Uh, you can throw in all the common factors and see if they explain it. Okay, so that's one way to do it. And maybe somebody will say, well, just because they're common factors doesn't mean they're the most highly correlated factors of consumption. Okay, so that may be, uh, I'm not saying, I'm not arguing in favor, I'm just saying that's one concern that would leave it, okay? So how would we address, how can we address that? Well, the, what is the alternative? If it's not time-varying expectation, maybe there's biased expectation. Market is not being rational, so for some reason it is biased, okay? So how do we address that? It's a very difficult thing to address because one of them is, you see it, one of them, you, uh, you, it's hard to measure market expectations, okay? So one test you can do is, you can basically say, okay, if, if it is a risk premium, it'll accrue uniformly. The risk premium on day one is going to be the risk premium on day 30 after portfolio formation, okay, if it lasts for 30 days. So under the risk premium hypothesis, you gotta find a uniform price appreciation over time, okay? So this is what you would expect. Okay, so let's do a thought experiment. What about if it's biased expectations? The biased expectations don't last forever, okay? The idea is they get corrected sometimes. And when, would they, when are they more likely to be corrected? Well, when the firm announces a chunk of news, okay? So what the chunk of news we are talking about is earnings, when earnings is announced. So that time they may, the market may correct it, so you would see a sharp uptick in return differences, okay? I'm surprised I didn't expect I'll talk for so long. But so we are going, I'm going to look at that, the earnings announcement returns if it is different, okay? So this is, again, for the recent sample period. If you just buy the portfolio, hold winners minus losers, you, know, you can see the returns gradually declining over time. But then I'm also looking at earnings announcement returns. So for each stock in the buy portfolio, I'm looking at the three-day returns. If, it, if they announce earnings one month later, what are their returns compared with if losers announce the earnings, okay? So you find positive coefficients, which kind of suggests that maybe it's the bias which gets corrected when the earnings are announced. Okay, so that's, so that leaves us with the biased expectations explanations, and there are two types of them. One of them is under reaction to information, and information comes, people don't, you know, winners are ones where people become optimistic at the end of the period. They're not sufficiently optimistic. Okay, the overreaction is people get good news, then get overly excited, become too optimistic, which eventually gets corrected. Okay, so these are the two possibilities. Uh, more from Sheridan, he'll talk about these things in more detail. It's very difficult to explain, so let Sheridan do that. Um, I'd like to add my thanks um, to the um, Jacobs Levy Center for, from Chris, 
from the selection committee, um, to Jagadish, of course, for being the brains behind all this. I'd like to also mention um, that this work was done at UCLA, um, which was a great time to work on this type of a project. Um, Jagadish mentioned that I was working with Mark Grinblatt on mutual funds at the time. Um, I was working with David Hirschheifer talking about behavioral finance. Um, Kent Daniels and Subra were our students at the time, and I've continued to work with them. And um, it was a kind of a magic time at UCLA where the students were um, contributing more um, to at least my education than the other way around, and um, we all had a great time at UCLA. So very, very pleased with that. Uh, one thing that I think about when I think about this paper, um, I go back to the old joke on The Economist seeing the $20 bill on the sidewalk and sort of walking by and saying, you know, that's obviously not a real $20 bill, otherwise someone would have already picked it up. That was kind of my initial thought when we were looking at the original momentum results. You know, we've got um, a lot of financial economists, a lot of people in the investment world all looking at um, trying to find a strategy that's simple that makes money. You know, how could it possibly be that um, there's something this simple and this straightforward uh, that's existed for this long? Um, that's still a good question. And, uh, you know, the question was, it took the academics quite a while to find it. Um, maybe if it took the academics quite a while to find it, it's taking others quite a while to find the results as well. So, um, in the last 30 years, I think that we have learned quite a bit about the causes of momentum and what's generating these return patterns. Um, Jayadish has basically started with you know, three broad categories, and I'm going to talk more specifically about the third category, the behavioral category um, that both Jagadish and I, and Subra who's here, Kent who's here, David Hirschleifer, Mark, we all sort of believe that it's a behavioral phenomenon. It's not something that, you know, due to risk and um, return. Okay, so very briefly, I'm going to give an overview of some recent theories of momentum. Okay, I believe that momentum is generated by informed traders that are informed but overconfident. Um, I think the retail noise traders are also important for generating these return patterns, and we'll try to um, talk about that in a little bit more detail. Um, some recent supporting evidence. I'm going to talk a bit about the differences in return patterns of Chinese A and B shares. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the changing nature of the Japanese stock returns. Okay, one thing that people have noted is when, at least when Jagadish and I were working on this paper, um, you could see momentum in all major markets in the world except for Japan. So the question is, why is Japan different and has Japan changed? And finally, very briefly, um, I want to put in a plug for the very first paper um, this morning. Um, Vincent did a great job looking at overnight returns. Um, are they different than returns during the day? And I think that also helps us understand um, what's causing momentum. And Vincent did a great job explaining this, so I don't want to steal his, his idea, but um, I wanted to plug this just to, so everybody is very much aware of the fact that this is an ongoing literature that's evolving. And even after 30 years, there's a lot that we're still learning. So the theory, and the theory is um, done in collaboration mainly with Subra, who I've been talking to about these ideas for a number of years. Um, Zhang Lu um, is a former student at UCLA who's now in Singapore. And in the second paper, Jagadish has joined us. And hopefully, we understand a little bit better in terms of what type of models are going to generate the return patterns we see. And again, we've seen this a hundred times, but the return patterns are um, momentum over, say, six to 12 months. Okay, reversals, one week reversals or one month reversals, and as Jagadji mentioned, the fact that the momentum strategy is more powerful if you skip a week or a month 
between the formation period and the holding period. So those are the facts that we'd like to explain. So the key model ingredients, and I'll make it as simple and as quick as possible. Actually, if you read the paper, it's a lot more complicated. Um, two types of investors. We've got retail noise traders, and as a group, they trade completely randomly. Okay, so they can't be predicted on what they're going to do. It's not based on any knowledge of anything. Um, think of it as pure noise. We have active fundamental traders, okay? They do have what we'll call private information. Um, so they're smart in that sense, but they tend to be overconfident, okay? In addition, and I'll talk about this more briefly, is we can think about two types of information. Um, there's public disclosures, and there's private information that gets revealed through the process of trading, okay? Okay, the important point is that, that retail noise traders generate reversal. Okay, so they're creating reversals for two reasons. First is their order flow has to, over some intervals, be negatively serially correlated. If they buy today, that means they eventually have to sell. If they're shorting the stock, they eventually have to cover their shorts. So inherently, it has to be negatively serially correlated. Okay, that's one reason why they're generating reversals. The second reason is that their trades will, since they're noise trades, they're going to move prices away from fundamentals. Okay, so if you move prices away from fundamentals, say you drive prices above fundamentals, over time information will be released that basically moves prices back towards fundamentals and vice versa. So just the nature of moving prices away from fundamentals is gonna cause um, shorter term reversals. Okay, the overconfident active investors, they create momentum in a number of different ways and the overconfidence can be exhibited in a lot of different ways, okay? The thing that um, we've been most thinking about is that they're skeptical about the quality of other sources of information that they don't collect themselves. So that could be public information or it could be private information, okay? So if I see you trading and I see your trades moving prices, I'm gonna be skeptical about whether or not you actually have information. I think you're a noise trader moving prices away from fundamentals, so I'm gonna take the other side of those trades. Okay, so the important thing to note here is that because I'm taking the other side of trades that I think are noise trades, but may actually be informed trades, I'm going to dampen the effect of the informed trades and lead to underreaction. Okay, so that's the important thing to note. The other thing to note um, is that I might trade on stale information. Okay, um, you had the information, you've moved the price up, I get the same information months later, and I'm too overconfident to think that the price already captures that information, and as a result, I'll come in, move the price up too high, and that'll lead to um, momentum again, but perhaps long-term overreaction. Okay, so that's basically the way the model works. Um, the thing that I want you to think about here is that I've got two types of investors, and the two types of investors, in some sense, work against each other. Okay, if I've got a lot of noise traders, okay, their action's going to lead to reversals, and if I've got a lot of active informed traders, okay, their actions are likely to lead to momentum. Okay, so the return patterns that we see in the stock markets of different countries and same countries over different time periods is going to be affected by the composition of the investors. Okay, so there's a lot we can learn about what's causing momentum by looking across markets and across time and trying to see whether the patterns differ um, depending on the composition of the investors. Okay, and I think I just said this so I can skip to the next slide. I'm going to talk about um, different research. Um, I'll start with an analysis of Chinese A and B shares. Okay, these are stocks that trade on the same companies but with different investors. Okay, I'll go into more details on that. I'll talk a little bit about Japan, okay? This was something that troubled Jagadish and I back 30 years ago, why Japan 
was the only country that was major that didn't have momentum. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about Japan changing and how that's changed the return patterns, and then I guess I'll end with a plug for Vincent's paper, um, which is basically telling us about the difference between um, information generated by trading and information that's disclosed. And again, he did a great job, so I don't really have to say much about that. Okay, so this is a paper um, with Andy Choi, who's a former student of mine who's at Hong Kong Poly and Subra from UCLA. Okay, the A and B market in China is really a unique and ideal experiment for understanding how investor composition affects return patterns. Okay, the stocks are identical, the companies are identical. Okay, they get the same dividends, essentially. Um, they have the same sort of um, governance power, not much, um, but um, there's essentially no difference in the two shares other than who owns those shares. Okay, the A shares have to be bought and sold in China um, using renminbi, and for the most part, up until recently, uh, recently um, foreign institutions are buying the A shares as well as the B shares, but historically, it's mainly um, Chinese nationals and about 90% Chinese retail traders. In our sample period, I think the median um, Chinese investor, retail investor, did not have a high school graduation. Okay, um, and there's hundreds of stories about how unsophisticated these investors are. Um, so the assumption is that the Chinese market, to some extent, the A market was dominated by the noise traders. On the other hand, the B market is um, a lot of Hong Kong investors. Um, you need access to foreign currency to buy the B shares. And if you're a foreign institution, you're gonna get access to the Chinese market through the B market rather than the A market, again, up until recently. Okay, again, perfect experiment. The exact same cash flow streams, but different investors. And the result is the returns in the A market exhibit significant short-term reversals, which is what we predict because they're driven by the retail investors, and no momentum. Okay, the short-term reversals is basically offsetting the tendency of momentum, and we can see no evidence of momentum in the A market. Okay, in the B market, it's just the opposite. Okay, strong momentum, okay, but no evidence of short-term reversals. Okay, so as I'd say, it's a, a great experiment. Um, the best experiment we could come up with for how does investor composition affect return patterns. Okay, Japan, and this is work in progress um, with Hao Zhang and Takeshi Yamada and Terry Zhang. Um, we've just been working on this for the last few months. And um, again, the thing to note is that Japan was a market that was dominated by retail investors up until relatively recently, okay? Around 2000, um, there was a remarkable shift in the Japanese market and um, foreign institutional participation increased substantially. Okay, so the question is, has the increase in foreign institutions in Japan affected the return patterns? And the evidence suggests that it does. Okay, again, consistent with our earlier work, there's almost no evidence of momentum prior to 2000. Um, there is evidence of momentum after 2000. Um, and the stocks with greater foreign ownership, and these are larger firms, growth firms in general, those firms exhibit greater momentum. Okay, so if you're a momentum trader and you were staying away from Japan, um, now Japan is open for the momentum traders. And if you concentrate more on the growth stocks and the stocks that other foreign institutions are buying, um, the evidence suggests that you'll do better. Um, just a note, though, that there was a momentum crash in 2009 in Japan that looked just like the momentum crash in the U.S. in 2009. Um, the other thing that we've noted, and I'm not sure exactly what's going on here, that if you look at the Japanese momentum portfolio and compare it to the U.S. momentum portfolio, the long short portfolios, those portfolios, their correlations have been increasing over time. 
Okay. So Japan's looking very much like the U.S. in terms of return patterns now. Okay, just a, my last plug. Um, I think that the momentum is being generated more by the behavior of um, the active investors whose information is basically incorporated into stock prices over time through their trading, not by underreaction to disclosed information. And again, Vincent, um, congratulations on a great paper. You had a great experiment for showing exactly that fact. So thank you guys very much. I really, really appreciate, um, again, the opportunity to work with Jagadish and um, the opportunity to work with both Subra and Kent, who are here today. And um, thank you again for the prize. The literature, um, actually confusing. Thanks for the plug for Subra, by the way. Um, but um, my question for you, Sheridan, is that um, there's a lot of findings on momentum you're still trying to grapple with. So there's this Cooper Gutierrez Hamid paper which says that momentum is stronger in up markets, right? Uh, when markets go up, momentum's higher, which I think many practitioners would know that that is in fact the case. Um, so Japan's been relatively flat. And so you're saying that it's the institutional entry that's doing it. But Cooper and Gutierrez and Hamid could argue that it's just that Japan's flat, it's not been rising. So we don't see momentum for that reason. You see what I'm saying? So the question is, how do you disentangle the bull bear market stuff from the institutional stuff? You see yeah, that? yeah, I haven't thought about that. I mean, again, just to remind everybody, the evidence is that on up markets, following up markets, the momentum effect is stronger than following down markets. And I think what you're saying, Subra, is that if you looked earlier um, in Japan, um, the markets were down, again, at least in the 90s, for sure. But if you look you know, at Japan in the 70s and 80s, um, there's no momentum in Japan in, say, the 80s, even though the market was increasing quite a bit over time. But I don't think that is what's driving the difference between the U.S. and Japan. One, one thing consistent with this A share, B share in China, it may be that there is more dominant retail investors pre, pre bubble, Jap Japan bubble, and maybe they uh, gave way to more institutional investors. So like Sharon was saying, there are more. I haven't looked at it deeply, uh, but that could also be a possible explanation. But yeah, it is a little bit inconsistent with what, uh, what's found in. Yeah, so again, the bubble in Japan is consistent with um, reversals. You got crazy people in Japan that moved some prices way up, those prices fell a lot. So you'd see big, big reversals in Japan over that time period. Let me ask a, a slightly different question. Uh, suppose I'm an asset owner, um, say a university endowment, and, or, or, and I have many asset managers coming to me sort of explaining their investment process. Do you think there's any way for asset managers to distinguish themselves from each other if they say they use momentum in their investment process? What do you mean exactly by well, can they just think, can, can a, is there any way for, you know, manager A that says, I mean, quants are often accused of sort of having crowded trades, right, on whether it be on momentum or whether it be on value. Is there any way that momentum can be used differently from one manager's process to another manager's, do you think? No, my understanding is most of these managers combine various quant signals. Okay, so talking to some of the managers, one change that I found when the quant signals are not doing well, uh, maybe in the 2000s they were not doing well, uh, they changed the pitch to we are doing quantamental. So we start with the quant and then superimpose a little bit of fundamental analysis on top of it. Uh, it's not just for momentum, it's for pretty much all quant signals. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of differentiation that Trump were attempting to say it's just this is one of the signals we're using, but then we are, we are kicking the tires and uh, doing our due diligence before we actually buy it. Yeah, I, I think one of the reasons why it's very important to have sort of a view of the theory generating these anomalies is that it gives the individual money managers basically ways to think through what's the best way of implementing the signal. And they're going to have different views on what's causing it. And as a result, they're going to have slightly different ways of implementation. And then you're going to get sort of some diversity 
in um, you know how you're actually um, trading these types of broad strategies. And I think if you didn't do that, then you're you got everybody hurting in and out of the same things, and it's kind of going to spell disaster for the whole industry. Uh, you were actually doing the radio show when we had a panel earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, and a bunch of the conversation was, well, number one, do we really need to care about whether there's a model? Uh, some folks had the view that, uh, well, it may not matter. It's a second order idea. If we can make money, it's persistent. And we don't spend a lot of time on models. Others said, well, um, uh, maybe that's, it's, it, there's another question that we should ask instead of a model. Um, but the real question I think that's on people's minds all the time, including when we teach students this, is something very logical, which is, um, <laughs> given that there are really well-funded, really smart traders, how does my mother-in-law trade against these guys and provide all the, uh, all the source of the alpha um, in, a, in a world of limited capital? How, 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 do the, how do the noise traders survive? Okay, so your mother-in-law is just very, very good at this? You'd or? like her a lot if you had a chance to meet her. <laughs> how, can she, how can she survive? I mean, why, 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 why does it continue? Um, oh, yeah. you're asking why the noise yeah, like traders... like in your, in your model, for example. Yeah, I think there's new noise traders are born every... What, what is the old saying? A sucker is born every day? Or, um, so the noise traders sort of come and go is, is, is basically the theory. Um, yeah, hundreds and, and of billions they, of dollars of alpha here. I mean, this, the alpha is huge, and it's across asset class. Right, right. I, I think the retail investor, it's very hard for them to take it, uh, exploit that. Okay, so, and especially because the strategies we are talking about, you have to really diversify it. Even then, it's more volatile than the market. Okay, so, uh, I think it can be one of the screens that they could put. And the other thing that makes, in my, when I looked at this 30 years of data, so I was also thinking about, when we did this paper, I didn't think it would last this long. Once you identify an anomaly, a lot of people rush in, okay, then it goes away. Maybe it's because of the volatility of the strategy. So you cannot use it as a standalone strategy. Uh, you can possibly do it with asset classes that you just move into one asset class versus another. But individual stock, it's very hard to do it. So that's possibly the reason why uh, it's harder to uh, exploit it and make it go away. An additional thing, you know, one of the questions that was asked during the radio show is what would be your advice to uh, your mother-in-law? Uh, although she didn't come up, but basically to the noise traders of the world. So one, one takeaway is you use this as one of the signals. You look at stocks which are going up, but that could be one of your signals. But if you look at it, the noise of the momentum profits is much, the noise in the portfolio is much larger than any individual stock. So unless you follow it systematically, it's going to be hard. And the other thing is, a lot of uh, investors think about this law of gravity, right? Well, once it goes up, it has to come down. So if it's something is below 50% or uh, below the high, yeah, that was going to go back up. I think that would, hopefully, this would enlighten them to the idea that it's not always what comes down goes up, and what goes up comes down. Yeah, so it's really a number of things that you've identified. Okay, excellent, thank you. Yeah, one thing I want to emphasize in our model, um, the guys that are making money on momentum aren't necessarily making the money from the noise traders. Mm. It's more you've got um, overconfident institutions. Some happen to be early, some happen to be late. And it's the late overconfident institutions that are losing the money the that are, in some sense, creating the, the juice for the noise trader. For, I mean, for the momentum for the guys. Trade, for the earlier trader. So in, in the 23 years that I've been trading these factors, I've certainly seen at least the way I measure it, substantial decay. Um, and, and that may be different than the way you um, uh, measure your sort of uh, uh, results. But I'm, I'm curious, and you know, uh, clearly coincident with that and with the um, uh, you know, ri rising and ebbing fortunes of stat or market neutral type of uh, quant traders who witnessed so many of these crashes in 2008 and subsequently, uh, in, in, in 2009, I should say, actually. Um, so we, we've seen a lot of uh, flavors of momentum crop up. People have tried to modify the original factor and so on. Um, w one of the things I, I've, I've found to be perhaps more promising is, is regime dependence, trying to incorporate some notion of regime around all of these factors, whether it's, uh, you know, Pharma French and y your type of factors. Uh, just wondering if you have thoughts on that. About, in, well, can you explain a little bit what, how you're thinking about regimes? You're saying 
in some economic conditions, um, some factors do well and other economic that's conditions. That's right, that's right. So, so you're basically thinking about timing the different factors? Exactly, because, I mean, after all, the crashes uh, tend to occur when there's an inflection point because the short side, you get the massive short squeeze in the, uh, on the short portfolio, right? So if you think about 2009 from March onwards, that's, that's the classic sort of instance of where you, you have the largest crash in the momentum factor because, well, the, the short side of the portfolio rallied pretty substantially. So if, if one has a simple, uh, you know, methodology to incorporate those, uh, uh, the, the kind of risk on risk off sentiment, that can make a pretty. Yeah, no, I definitely think that if you have a way of doing that, it's extremely useful. Um, I haven't seen a lot of evidence of simple strategies of timing the factors. Um, there's clearly some evidence that the factor returns um, are exhibiting momentum themselves to some extent. Um, but I'm not sure whether if you look at, say, the book to market of a, of a, of a factor portfolio, whether that predicts the future returns or not. I'm not, what, what are the instruments you're using to predict the factors? Um, well, so as you mentioned, a lot of people look at the momentum or the value of the factor right. itself or other characteristics of, of the factors to try to time them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we, we've also looked at just macro variables and other, you know, just kind of an mm -hmm. independent uh, regime ID model, nothing right. to do with the factors specifically, but you kind of do the regime ID separately and then try to time the factors. Mm -hmm. So one, one uh, which came up in up markets was the down markets. If you look at the last three years or something, when it goes up, uh, when the market is going up, momentum does well. When the market comes down, it's not doing so well. But what is what actually dominates that effect is also uh, momentum doesn't do well in high volatile markets. The volatility is very high. Stay off momentum at that point in time, okay? Because uh, in low volatility times when you want to emphasize momentum. This is something that is, we found in a recent research with Sobra and Amit. Uh, it's true across the world. So wherever momentum works, it works. Uh, high volatility is the big, biggest uh, state variable that you can uh, condition on when it'll go up or go down, okay? And uh, one additional thing is, people have noted the negative correlation between value and momentum. Uh, one of the papers actually have uh, documented that value strategies do better during a high volatile period than low volatility period, okay? So that's kind of one uh, diversification across factors is also something you may want to consider. Thank you. Hello, hi. Um, you mentioned in the presentation that uh, the, essentially the retail or the noise traders, they cause um, short-term reversal. Um, is it because um, the short-term uh, trade, the, the, the retail noise traders are more into profit-taking um, or doesn't have the nerves to essentially keep uh, something, hold on to um, positions that, are, that have already generated uh, profit in paper or is it something to do with essentially short-term versus long-term tax uh, angles that retail traders may not care as much as the institutional uh, investors do. Okay, well in the model, um, the retail investors aren't like, they don't have any very specific behavioral bias. Um, they're basically acting randomly. Okay, so again, they're causing the reversals um, for two reasons. One reason is that they're driving prices away from fundamentals and then prices will revert towards fundamentals. So that's gonna cause a reversal. And the other is, even though they're sort of random, um, they're, they've gotta reverse their trades eventually. So if all the noise traders for some reason go in and they all wanna buy game stock, they push the price up, eventually they all have to sell and that's gonna push the price down. Gentlemen, congratulations. Thank you so much for your innovation. We appreciate you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.